The Baseball Hall of Fame has some 339 elected members. Of these, did you know only 19 were catchers? On today's episode of History and Relics, we're featuring Ernie Lombardi. We'll be showcasing a pair of relics that were once owned by Lombardi, and we'll share with you details of his Hall of Fame career. We'll also be touching upon a segment of his life that wasn't so bright that led Ernie to attempt suicide. Lastly, we have a special guest today, Jim Ford, who is a suicide prevention advocate out of Marietta, Georgia, who is a volunteer for the Crisis Text Line and the American Foundation for Suicide, or the AFSP. So keep it right here. This will surely be an episode you won't want to miss. Right here on History and Relics. Ernesto Natale Lombardi was born April 6, 1908, in Oakland, California. He was one of four children born to Mr. and Mrs. Dominic Lombardi. Ernie had three sisters, Stella, Rena, and Rose. Dominic Lombardi immigrated from Italy and owned a small grocery store and is where Ernie later worked as a young man. Lombardi, who would grow to be six foot three as an adult, was taller than most children around his age. He spent much of his time playing sandlot baseball at Bayview Park. When he was 12, he played for a semi-pro team, Ravoli's Meat Market. Coaches took notice of Lombardi's strong arm, and soon his career as a catcher began. A scout from the Oakland Oaks tried to sign Ernie, but the youngster refused because he didn't want to leave the Bay Area to play for one of the Oakland farm clubs. However, after a short stint of running the family grocery store while his father was away, Lombardi changed his mind and contacted the Oaks. He realized that he might prefer a career in professional baseball over that of a grocer. After a brief stop in Ogden, Utah, Lombardi honed his craft back home in Oakland. From 1928 through 1930, he smoked the ball in Pacific Coast League parks, posting batting averages of 377, 366, and 370. His defensive ability was also supreme. He registered an amazing 95 assists in 1929 and topped that mark with 102 in 1930. Lombardi possessed some distinctive physical characteristics as well, including a pair of huge hands and a bigger than normal sized nose. Here's a picture of Lombardi holding seven baseballs in one hand. His nose was said to be just as enormous. They began kidding me about my nose and calling me schnoz back in the Coast League, he once said. But the funny thing was, I didn't get too much razzing from the bench jockeys. Most of it came from the fans. Lombardi was good-natured about the kidding he received and often showed off a self-depreciating humor of his own. The Brooklyn Dodgers, or Robins as they were referred to then, sent Hank DeBerry, Eddie Moore, and $50,000 to Oakland for Lombardi on January 19, 1931. Brooklyn skipper Wilbert Robinson favored seasoned veterans over green kids, which left Ernie at the bench watching Al Lopez handle most of the catching chores. But Lombardi produced when he was given the opportunity. Lombardi's stay in Brooklyn was short, and on March 14, 1932, he was made part of a six-player deal that sent him to Cincinnati. He started instantly with the Reds, batting over 300 in six of his first seven seasons there. Lombardi later enjoyed some of his biggest career days at the Philadelphia Bandbox at the expense of the Phillies. On May 8, 1935, he tied a league record with four doubles in a game as the Reds pasted the Phils 15-4. On May 9, 1937, Lombardi became the second Red to tally six hits in a nine-inning game. In a 21-10 shellacking of the Phillies, Ernie stroked two doubles, 
drove in five runs and scored three runs. Between 1932 and 1937, Cincinnati finished in the cellar four times, and the manager seat was more like a carousel. Bill McKechnie came to the Queen City and took the reins before the 1938 season. I like to play for Bill, said Lombardi. He was quieter than other managers. But all he'd have to do is look at you, out over top his glasses, and you know you'd done something wrong. In 1938, under the management of Deacon Bill, Lombardi finally received some notice of his abilities when he led the circuit that season with a 342 batting average. He smashed 19 home runs, had 95 RBIs, and hit 30 doubles, which allowed him to take the first of his two National League batting championships. He was also the starting catcher for the National League team in his third of eight All-Star appearances and was later honored by the Baseball Writers Association and the Sporting News as 1938's Most Valuable Player. On the negative side, Lombardi set a National League record for the most double plays hit into a season with 30. The record stood for 70 years until Houston's Miguel Tejada broke it in 2008. One aspect missing from Lombardi's skill set, though, was speed. Although he was a smart base runner, he was not a fast one. In fact, he was widely recognized as one of the slowest runners in baseball history. It was often said that Lombardi doubled the left to beat out a single. Behind home plate, however, Lombardi was as agile as they come. He possessed a strong throwing arm and moved with ease to catch pop-up flies around home plate. The Reds won the pennant in 1939 and 1940. Bucky Walters won 49 games and Paul Derringer 45 in the two seasons to lead a solid staff. Lombardi once said, you could sit in a rocking chair and catch them guys. In contrast, Lombardi felt that Johnny Vandermeer was hard to catch because he was a hard thrower and erratic. You can never tell where the ball was going to end up. Once, Pepper Martin of St. Louis was on third base dancing around in an attempt to distract Vandermeer. His strategy worked, and Vandermeer uncorked a pitch way outside. Lombardi just reached up for the ball with his bare hand and snagged it. Vandermeer would later tell Lombardi, listen, if you're gonna sit back there and catch me barehanded, the least you could do after you throw the ball back to me is shake your hand a little like I had something on the pitch. You're making me look bad. Lombardi also caught both of Johnny Vandermeer's no-hitters on June 11th and June 15th of 1938. He wasn't a defensive whiz, but by most accounts, he handled the staff well and called a good game. 1940 would be a difficult year for Lombardi, personally. His friend and backup catcher, Willard McKee Hirschberger, would become the first and since only active player to commit suicide during a baseball season. Hershberger played for the pennant-winning Reds in the 1939 World Series loss to the Yankees with a hit in two plate appearances. In July 1940, when Lombardi suffered a finger injury, Hershberger took his place in the starting lineup. When the Reds lost a game to the New York Giants during a heated pennant race, teammates made it known that they would have won if Lombardi was catching. He made it known that he blamed himself for the loss of another game on August 2nd to the Boston Braves. Reds manager Bill McKechnie told him that it was nonsense to feel depressed about the loss. But the next day, Hershberger ended his life with a razor in his room at the Copley Hotel in Boston. He was only 30. His father had also committed suicide in 1928. In Lombardi's 10 years with the Reds, from 1931 to 1941, he hit over 300 in seven of those years. By all accounts, he was a terrific teammate and a good-hearted person. However, he was not fond of signing autographs. It wasn't until a youngster asked him if he was illiterate that Lombardi, to dispute the point, signed a scrap of paper. 1941 was also the year Lombardi would have been first eligible to receive his Silver Lifetime Pass that we're featuring today. The story tradition of baseball's lifetime passes appears to originate from 1907 when the NAPBL the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues, known as Minor League Baseball today, presented President Theodore Roosevelt, our nation's 26th President of the United States, with a 14-karat gold entry pass valid at ballparks nationwide. Fast forward to the 1930s, 
the lifetime passes under the Ford Frick administration were somewhat experimental as they were made of heavy stock paper. Frick soon thought better than to issue paper passes if they were going to last a lifetime. And since the American League didn't have its own lifetime pass honor established yet, Frick partnered with American League President William Herridge to better the recognition process for both leagues and its players. Soon, players on either side could enter any major league park anywhere in the country. Both men decided to match the NAPBL's original idea and have their passes now created from precious metals, including gold and silver. Frick and Herridge agreed the contract with one of the best and renowned fine jewelers in the country for the design and craftsmanship of the passes, Lambert Brothers Jewelers in New York City. The first of the Frick Herridge era lifetime passes were soon produced and distributed in mid to late 1935 through early 1936. The pair also decided to ante up for players who had played 20 or more years of professional baseball by issuing their passes in solid gold. Solid silver passes were issued to those who had previously gotten the paper versions. These passes are believed to measure out to be approximately four and a quarter inches long by two and three quarter inches high, such as the one that you see here issued to Bobby Lowe who had previously received a paper pass. To keep pace with the luster of gold, similar but smaller solid silver passes were issued to other players having played baseball at least 10 years but less than 20. These measure out to be two and three quarter inches long by an inch and three quarters high and come with a leather sheath. Based upon the minimum tenure, Lombardi would have been first eligible to receive his smaller solid silver pass in 1941 when he played for the Reds, but ultimately he received this silver pass sometime between 1941 and 1947. Lombardi's batting average plummeted to 264 in 1941. Differences with general manager Warren Giles and the dramatic drop in his hitting prompted Cincinnati to sell Lombardi to the Boston Braves before the 1942 season. The Braves, who were led by none other than Casey Stengel, were a brutal group. First baseman Max West was the leading power hitter with 16 home runs and 56 RBIs. Lombardi, in only 309 at-bats, was credited under the rules of the day with leading the league in hitting with a 330 average that earned him a spot on the National League All-Star squad in taking a second National League batting championship honors. Despite the fine year he had in Boston, Lombardi asked the Braves to trade him and held out until a deal could be completed. On April 27, 1943, he got his wish. He was dealt to the New York Giants for catcher Hugh Pollen and infielder Connie Ryan. Lombardi was later quoted, To say that I'm highly pleased to become a Giant doesn't adequately express my feelings. I've had my eye on that left field scoreboard in the polo grounds for a long time, and now I'm going to see what can be done about it as a home field target. With World War II raging, Many leading players went to serve in the many branches of the armed forces. For Lombardi, whose selective service number was 4541, the chances of being drafted seemed unlikely. But he was called to take his draft physical in September 1943, but was turned down by the Army. Soon after, in 1944, Lombardi married Bernice Ayers of Oakland, California. The couple had no children. In 1944, still with the Giants organization, Lombardi posted a career-high seven RBIs. In two of the three years he started for the Giants, Lombardi batted over 300. But before the 1946 season, with Lombardi aging, the Giants purchased Walker Cooper from St. Louis to assume the catching burden. Lombardi played for two more years, retiring after the 1947 season. Unfortunately for Lombardi, his life after baseball was not a good one. He held different jobs on the West Coast, unable to settle into a steady profession. He lived his life as a recluse. By April 1953, Lombardi had been battling depression and agreed to go to a sanitarium. While en route, he and his wife stopped in Castro Valley, California to visit some relatives. One evening, after using the bathroom, Ernie said he was not feeling well and went to lie down in a bedroom. His wife Bernice checked on him a short time after and discovered that he had cut his throat with a razor that he'd found in the bathroom. 
He struggled with emergency personnel, saying that he wanted to die. Lombardi was rushed to a hospital where he was listed in critical condition and received a blood transfusion. Fortunately, Lombardi was saved from a suicide attempt and entered a private sanitarium where he later recovered. In 17 seasons, Ernie Lombardi had a career batting average of 306 with 190 home runs and 990 RBIs. He returned to the Pacific Coast League and played one final year of professional baseball in 1948 with Oakland and Sacramento. In 2003, Lombardi was inducted into the Pacific Coast League Hall of Fame. Even though Lombardi was one of the top four catchers of the first half of the century, his Hall of Fame candidacy failed to gather momentum. He crested on the writer's ballot at 16% in 1964. His poor showing was curious, considering the writers gave the nod to Mickey Cochran, Bill Dickey, and Gabby Harnett. Lombardi was so disgruntled about his exclusion that he vowed that he would never attend the induction ceremonies even if he was elected. He later re-entered the baseball world when he took a job as a press box attendant at Candlestick Park in San Francisco. Lombardi loved to talk baseball, especially about his playing days. Ernie Lombardi died on September 26, 1977, after a long illness. He was survived by his three sisters. His wife, Bernice, had preceded him in death in 1973. Lombardi finally received the call from the hall in Cooperstown posthumously in 1986 via the Veterans Committee who led a crusade to get Lombardi elected. Lombardi joined Bobby Doerr and Willie McCovey. Lombardi was inducted into the Cincinnati Reds Hall of Fame in 1958 and it was the Reds that he represented upon entering the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 1986. In 2004, a full-size bronze statue of Ernie was dedicated outside Great American Ballpark in Cincinnati joining those of Frank Robinson, Joe Nuxall, and Ted Klazuski at the entrance to the ballpark. We had a chance to visit Great American Ballpark recently, so let's show you around the outside of the stadium there and pay a visit to Ernie, as well as some of the other baseball greats that played with the Reds. Upon researching out today's story for History and Relics, I didn't know about Ernie Lombardi's bouts with depression, nor his suicide attempt in 1953. Further, I didn't know about his friend and teammate, Willard McKee Hirschberger, who had committed suicide 13 years before that. It definitely took me off guard a bit and left me with a pause. Depression and suicide can affect any one of us at any time. It does not discriminate. So before I close out today's presentation, I'd like to introduce you to Jim Ford, who is a suicide prevention advocate out of Marietta, Georgia. Jim is a volunteer with the Crisis Text Line and the American Foundation for Suicide, or the AFSP. Jim has a special message today, a plea to those in need, a word of encouragement, and an offer of help. Jim and I share in this message and we want each and every one of you to know that you matter. You count. And we want and need you to be here today and tomorrow because there are still a great many positive things in store for you. So with that, let me turn it over to Jim Ford. Hey everybody, this is Jim Ford. I want to thank my good buddy, John Hefter, for giving me an opportunity to speak to you about mental illness and suicide, suicide prevention. 
Did you know that mental illness does not discriminate? It doesn't matter your background, where you're from, your social status, your wealth, your job. We all can be vulnerable to mental illness. We have to have those real conversations to talk about it, to remove the stigma of mental illness. Remember, it's okay not to be okay but help is available 24 seven. You can reach a crisis counselor at the crisis text line simply by texting hello to 741-741. That's right up the left side of your phone. You can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. The American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, AFSP.org, also has tremendous amount of resources. It's okay not to be okay. You matter. Please reach out for help if you're struggling, if you're battling. We all need to take time for our own self-care. The world moves fast. Take time for your own self-care. And remember, you will never instill the thought of suicide by asking someone if they're having these thoughts, but ask in a loving and caring way. For example, hey, I noticed you haven't been acting like yourself the last couple of weeks. I'm worried about you. Are you having any thoughts to end your life? There's a Hall of Famer, Ernie Lombardi. John's got a few of his uh, memorabilia. He struggled with depression and even attempted suicide. But through the support of his wife, family, and friends, he was able to get out of that dark period into the light. And we can do that as well. Reach out for help. You're enough. You're worth it and you're not a burden. Take care. Thanks so much for watching. You matter. Stay gold. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our program. If you like our content, we ask that you give us a thumbs up, a like, share with your friends, subscribe to our channel, and ring that notification bell so you always know when our new content is published. And all of this costs nothing but means a lot to us and keeps us growing. You may also leave us a tip if you choose. The address is provided here on your screen, and a link is provided in the description area below. So until next time, everyone, this one is history.